chapter of HFMA, and welcome to another of our Tennessee Trains on Tuesdays. Uh, before I introduce our speaker this morning, um, I do have a few housekeeping items that I would uh, like to make you aware of. Um, remember that Spring Institute is next week, and you can still register online at thespringinstitute.org. Um, the Gloria Adams Golf Tournament is Monday, May 19th at the Vanderbilt Legends Club in Franklin, and there's more information also at thespringinstitute.org slash golf. Uh, if you have CPE requirements uh, to receive a continuing education certificate, you must be connected to the webinar for at least 90% of the total time, respond to at least three of the four polling questions. You do not need to get these right, but you do have to respond. And more de details can be found in the policy section of our website at tnhfma.org. So this morning, we're very um, uh, pleased to have Paul Kim with us. Paul is um, Paul is a principal in the Health Law Group at Ober Kaler, who represents health care providers and manufacturers. And Paul advises clients in all aspects of health law, from corporate compliance counseling to reimbursement litigation. He's worked in uh, reimbursement uh, arena, fraud and abuse, privacy, clinical research issues from the patient, provider, payer, and government perspectives. And he has a unique understanding of healthcare industry and an in-depth knowledge of the issues and challenges today's clients are facing. Um, and without further ado, I will uh, turn it over to Paul Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon. Um, today we'll be uh, discussing uh, physician supervision. Um, when I worked at the central office of CMS, um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services here in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, physician supervision was not only um, imposed, not only imposed for purposes of determining medical necessity, uh, but also uh, to to uh, ensure quality of care. Um, and today um, we will go we will uh, go through the variety of services as well as certain types of providers and suppliers where physician supervision is imposed uh, by CMS. Okay, so let's talk about the levels of supervision that CMS has defined. Uh, first, and probably the least stringent level, is general physician supervision. What that requires is that the physician provide overall direction and control. Um, the physician need not be physically present in the office or with the patient or with whomever um, uh, that he or she is supervising, a nurse, a physician assistant, uh, etc. Um, the physician, however, does need to provide overall personnel training as well, uh, especially when it uh, involves um, certain medical equipment or devices and supplies. Uh, and to the extent equipment is involved, the physician is also required to um, provide uh, overall maintenance of such medical equipment. Um, so these are the elements of what CMS expects to see uh, when CMS has established and imposed general physician supervision level for particular services uh, or particular uh, providers. Uh, clearly the main issue for most of us in the audience um, is the fact that the supervising physician is not required to be actually even in the office and may in fact be outside the office and available by cell or pager. The next level of physician supervision is direct supervision. As simple as these terms may appear to be, we will discuss further later 
But um, this has caused tremendous confusion, uh, quite frankly, since Medicare was established back in 1965. Uh, but basically, direct supervision does require physical presence of the physician, but in the quote-unquote office suite. Okay? Again, very simple terms, but we will discuss further later um, the variety of situations that meet uh, potentially an office suite. Furthermore, the supervising physician must be immediately available. Very simple terms. Nevertheless, a um, variety of questions and factual scenarios that actually may comply uh, and, and, and constitute immediate availability. Now, in some of the older claim forms and maybe even some of the existing claim forms uh, for, for non-Medicare um, payers, you may see the term direct personal supervision. Well, CMS tried to uh, clean this up as much as possible, but bottom line, whenever you see that term, either in a manual provision or a regulation or a claim form, really what the payer is meaning is direct supervision. Okay, so again, physical presence in the office suite, whatever that may be, and the physician must be immediately available, whatever that may be. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, and probably the most stringent, is personal physician supervision. Here, CMS expects the physician to be in the room with the patient or with the nurse or technician or other clinical staff whom he or she is supervising. So you can see that at one end, general supervision, fairly easy to understand because from a physical presence point of view, the doctor does not even need to be in the office. And then at the other end here, personal supervision, also fairly easy to understand because the physician must be in the room with the patient or the, the uh, clinical staff that he or she is supervising. So what's in the middle is what has caused so much confusion. So let's, let's break it down. Um, but before we continue in, in, in terms of um, direct supervision, I want to take this opportunity right now to just um, get a sense of the audience and ask the first polling question. Valerie? Okay, let's get this polling question launched here. Has your organization ever experienced a denial of a claim for inadequate physician supervision? And please choose one. Okay, we have about 96%, so I'm going to go ahead and close that one. And I'll share these results. Looks like 54% um, say it doesn't apply to them, 35% say I don't know, and 12% say yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'll try to make this nevertheless interesting <laughs> for those of you um, where this issue is not applicable or um, um, hasn't experienced this. I mean, I guess bottom line is in terms of physician supervision, even though that may appear to be a scope of practice issue, a licensing issue, many insurance companies, including the federal insurance company, the Medicare program, and really that's what they are, um, an insurance company, have used physician supervision as means of auditing and as means of requesting uh, fund, a return of the fund, a refund of the fund, recruitment. So hopefully that financial aspect has sparked some additional interest at this point. Now, uh, but before we start returning any monies or arguing about any monies that are owed to the government or other third-party payers, um, let's talk further about direct supervision. Uh, again, 
this has caused uh, most the most amount of confusion in terms of physician supervision. It has been the subject of the, the most amount of government audits, investigations, and litigation. Okay? As I mentioned earlier, direct supervision really has two components. First is office suite. All right? What is that? Well, think about your own uh, physician um, whom you visited recently. All right? You go in, there's a reception area, and a couple of uh, patient rooms, maybe even a smaller waiting room before you meet the doctor. Those are all typically considered office suite. Okay. However, um, you know there are uh, different types of office suite, and some practices may have offices on different uh, floors, uh, floor one, floor three, for example. Um, other offices might be separated so that suite A might be part of the doctor's office. Suite B may be a um, maybe an IT company. Suite C may be a CPA firm, and then Suite D, as in David, is the other part of the physician office, uh, all on the same floor. Well, clearly you can see the tremendous amount of uh, permutations of facts, um, and therefore the central office of CMS deliberately uh, did not define office suite further, but instead deferred to local Medicare contractors that process and pay claims to determine whether or not a particular provider's uh, factual scenario meets the definition of office suite. Um, typically, you may have different buildings on a campus. Uh, you may have different floors in the same building. And as I mentioned, uh, different offices on the same floor. Um, typically, however, most of the Medicare contractors have been OK as long as the offices are on the same building, okay? It's a very general statement, but that appears to be the most outer boundary that the contractors would um, approve. Even if the building next door is physically closer than the top floor and the first floor, okay? Even though physically, geographically closer, generally the Medicare contractors have been focused on the same building. Um, likewise, when it comes to immediately available, again, a variety of permutations of facts. Um, there are certain aspects of availability, however. The most obvious one is physical distance, geographic distance. Hence, the linkage and the use of the term office suite, but also from a practical perspective, I think there's what I coined as audio distance. You know, if in a, in a real life situation, if a nurse is tending to a patient and the nurse needs assistance, he or she may yell for help. And as long as a supervising physician can hear that, isn't that immediately available? Doesn't that constitute immediate availability? Furthermore, even if the supervising physician is right next door in the next office, if the supervising physician is also with the patient uh, and maybe involved in some deep conversation about their history and physical whatever, um, you know, what I coin as mental distance or preoccupation, uh, doesn't that also raise questions about whether the person is immediately available? Or is that enough that the person is right next door? So again, depending on the factual scenarios, the Medicare contractors have deferred, I'm sorry, the central office of CMS has deferred to the Medicare contractors to determine not only whether those facts represent an office suite, but also whether those facts of a particular provider or supplier represent uh, immediate availability. Um, you know, we will discuss further later, but sometimes, um, there are situations where CMS has specified the maximum number of services or personnel that a supervising physician can supervise. However, in most of the services and for most of the providers, that is not specified. But, but that issue, however, need not necessarily be, um, you know, uh, you don't need to inquire that uh, with the local contractor necessarily 
However, to the extent that it may raise issues of vitamin media availability, that's when um, it may be um, ripe for uh, inquiry and, 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 and hopefully you'll receive a response. Generally, from my personal experience as well as um, experience of other clients, despite the potential delay, the Medicare contractors have been generally responsive uh, in answering questions about whether or not certain um, circumstances meet, meet an office suite or meet uh, immediate availability. Now, one issue that I do want to note uh, at this point is when it comes to a supervising physician, there actually is a, a, a case from Hawaii where uh, a, an oncologist who was working at the uh, infusion center uh, was documented and um, um, logged in as a supervising physician, but because of contractual disputes, the oncologist uh, pursued a whistleblower lawsuit. The government intervened and um, argued that immediate that uh, direct supervision did not exist. Uh, in part, in main part, because that oncologist did not even know he was the supervising physician. So how could he possibly render the requisite level of direct supervision? Well, uh, I think to the surprise of many folks, both legal and clinical. The court dismissed the lawsuit, dismissed the False Claims Act whistleblower case, in, in part holding that the physician, the supervising physician, does not actually need to be aware that he or she is the supervising physician. And that the only two requirements are that, one, the supervising physician is in the office suite, and two, that the supervising physician is immediately available. So very surprising uh, to many, uh, but um, very um, poignant in terms of whether or not um, preoccupation uh, or other issues of immediate availability may be a bar uh, to actually being immediately available. Now, before we continue with the next issue, um, I also want to take time again to ask the second polling question. Uh, Valerie, please. Thank you. Okay. Give me one second here. Hmm. Martha, I may need your assistance here. I can't seem to get it to progress to the next polling question. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got it. Has your organization ever contacted CMS or a Medicare contractor to ask a question related to physician supervision? Okay, we have about 86% voting. I'm going to close this and share the results. And we have 8% answering yes, 12% no, 32% I don't know, and 48% does, doesn't apply to me. Okay, thank you. So hopefully those of you who did um, actually pose an inquiry, whether anonymously or not, uh, did receive the answer uh, that actually addressed the question, even if it wasn't the, 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 the good answer that you were looking for. But regardless, um, I'm glad to hear that uh, the, uh, many folks have actually pursued that route um, because, again, it, it actually is available and despite the potential delay uh, is one of the best ways to protect yourself from subsequent audits because you have that inquiry in hand um, uh, demonstrating that you've, you've asked the government contractor about this and the government contractor responded and you relied on that response, okay? Now, um, you know, obviously before you actually do make that inquiry, um, you should also uh, conduct your own research and due diligence to try to see whether there are particular answers that uh, do apply to you uh, because I know most folks 
um, um, would rather not contact the government uh, if not necessary. And so I want to now talk about the variety of sources that are available uh, so that you can obtain answers about physician supervision levels, so that you can comply with them, so you can avoid audits and investigations. Now, the, um, there are a variety of sources. Um, of course, there's the Social Security Act, which is the Medicare law. But quite frankly, it's very broad and, uh, and some, somewhat vague in many cases uh, uh, because it's a statute. Um, and even though it may give authority for CMS to implement those uh, statutory provisions, um, not many times will you actually see particular congressional language you know, mandating certain levels of physician supervision. Um, so what you see most of the time is the federal code of regulations that, the, that CMS actually issues to implement uh, the um, uh, particular statutory provision. So, for example, if Congress um, included a provision in the federal in, in the Social Security Act to provide diagnostic testing to Medicare beneficiaries, well, that language alone would authorize CMS to now draft and promulgate regulations that detail how the Medicare program would render would furnish diagnostic services to Medicare patients. So regulation is uh, one of the primary sources of, of information. Unfortunately, it's not um, exhaustive. In other words, you won't necessarily find physician supervision um, in the regulations. Clearly, the three levels of physician supervision that I just described, they are actually uh, cited in the regulation. But when you go through different types of services and different types of providers and suppliers, that regulation regarding physician supervision is not necessarily referenced. Nevertheless, when you go down further in the chain of, or hierarchy of guidance materials, source materials, you'll see that the Medicare program does indeed require certain levels of supervision. So that you can't just stop at regulations is, is, is my primary point here. Next level, also equally binding, are national coverage determinations. These are um, basically medical policies that CMS issues at a national level to determine whether a certain service or a certain healthcare item may be covered and under what conditions, under what type of uh, clinical criteria uh, would Medicare cover and pay for those services. Um, in addition, although not uniform and not always consistent, you may see some local contractors issue their own local coverage determination. Uh, they may be, in essence, verbatim as the national coverage determination, but not always. Um, and they may have additional nuances added on. Now, most of the time, unlike the NCDs, the LCDs tend to be uh, a better resource for identifying physician supervision levels. So in other words, the NCD might not specify, but when you look at the LCD of your local MAC, um, if one is available, you may see some physician supervision levels being imposed as a requirement, um, as a condition of, of payment. In addition, there are national Medicare manuals uh, discussing coverage, claims processing, benefits, program integrity, and so forth. So you may find certain um, types of uh, physician supervision levels being imposed in the manuals instead even though the regulations are silent, even though the coverage determinations are silent. So that's an additional source where you need to be mindful to double check so that you can make sure you're, com you're being compliant. And of course, uh, there is the uh, Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. Um, this is uh, an annual regulation of CMS. Um, that divi the division that uh, issues this annual reg is basically where I work. Uh, at the, when I worked at the central office here in Baltimore, and we would um, issue regulations, but also work the databases to make sure that certain services were paid uh, appropriately. Um, uh, but you'll see in that fee schedule, fee schedule database, and this is not the fee schedule that's published in the Federal Register along with the regulations, but you have to go onto the CMS website, 
um, and actually pull up the databases, you'll see that on one of the columns is the is a column for physician supervision. And for each each uh, service, uh, particular service denoted by a CPT code, you'll see whether or not CMS has imposed a, a, le a particular level of physician supervision, and if so, what that may be. The, and CMS also has a legend, um, um, and it may be difficult to find, so I presented it here uh, in the next slide. But for example, for a particular CPT code, when you go to that column in the database under physician supervision, you may see a number one in that. And, and you'll see from the slide that means that that particular service requires general supervision. Okay? Now, there may be some other types of services where um, if, if it's performed by certain types of non-physician practitioners, CMS won't, is not imposing any physician supervision at all. Okay, and you'll see those codes there as well. Typically, that column has been used to denote different levels of physician supervision uh, for diagnostic tests. Okay, not always, but typically uh, you'll see codes next to diagnostic tests. Um, and you'll see from the rest of the, uh, the legend, so to speak, um, most of these services, even if it involves um, non-physicians or physicians, they really are describing diagnostic services and therefore uh, most of the physician supervision level codes that are included in the fee schedule, physician fee schedule database, um, really are just describing uh, those levels required of diagnostic services. Now, um, before I uh, dive into the particular services and providers that require physician supervision and what level that may be, I would like to take this time to ask my next polling question. Thank you, Valerie. Okay. What is your organization's primary source for information regarding physician supervision? We have about 82%. I'll leave it open a few more seconds. If anyone else would like to vote or poll. Okay. I'm going to close that and the results. It looks like um, most of us are using transmittals or bulletins from CMS or Medicare contractors at 46%. 38% attorney or consultant. 8% trade associations, 4% commercial publications, and 4% of us like to read the Federal Register. Wow, Federal Register, those are hardcore uh, healthcare personnel. And uh, I'd be happy to talk to those 38% uh, working with attorneys and consultants. Um, anyway, I'm glad that you're familiar with these different publications because they do a very good job of summarizing um, uh, the particular uh, source materials that I just mentioned before. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having issues with the slides. I hope everyone can see them. Valerie, can you still see the slides? Um, it's it's partial on my screen. It's like it's slowly coming across the screen. Okay, it might be the connection. Uh, one second, please.
Valerie, can you see the slides now? No, Paul. Unfortunately, I can't. Okay. All right. I apologize, everybody. I don't. I don't know what's going on. That's it. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Thank Great. you. All right. Sorry, I'm trying to move to slide where we were, but it's just not one second. Okay, good. So um, let's go down the list of particular services and providers where CMS policy and regulations require physician supervision. Um, the first policy uh, or first benefit is called Incident 2. Uh, essentially, Incident 2 uh, uh, works like this. You go see a physician, the physician provides a service to you, and then tells you to see a nurse or a technician for additional services. Even though the physician did not provide directly that uh, subsequent service, as long as the requirements of Incident 2 are met, the physician may bill for that particular service using the physician's name on the claim as if the physician directly rendered that subsequent service to you. Okay, And one of the requirements of Incident 2 is physician supervision. And here, direct supervision is what's required. Um, this has been around since 1965, but again, because of the vagueness, the deliberate vagueness of the definition of direct supervision, it's caused tremendous um, confusion, but is probably the um, one of the top reasons why uh, healthcare providers uh, are subject to investigations and audits uh, by the government. Um, interestingly enough, even though radiation therapy is listed separately in the statute, uh, chemotherapy is not. And so therefore, the reason why Medicare covers chemotherapy is because it falls under the definition of an incident to service. Okay? Uh, likewise, infusion centers um, um, of, uh, are paid under Medicare because there's an incident to service and must meet uh, the levels of supervision, the requirements of physician, requirements of incident to, including the physician uh, uh, direct supervision by a physician. Uh, cardiac rehab is another benefit uh, that falls under an incident to service, and so therefore must meet the requirements of incident to and uh, must also have direct physician supervision. Now. Medicare was trying to be pragmatic, and so they, they issued a couple of exceptions. For example, if a patient is homebound, is unable to uh, leave the home, maybe even bedridden altogether, but nevertheless needs services, um, Medicare is, does not require the physician to always render all of the services in the patient's residence, uh, but rather may have a nurse, for example, go visit the service, go visit the patient to render the service uh, without the physician, and, and, so, and yet that service of the nurse may be billable as an incident to service, even though there was no supervising physician in the patient's home at all. Okay, So to, to accommodate those types of chronically ill patients, uh, even under the incident to uh, requirement, uh, CMS has alleviated and exempted uh, those services uh, from the direct physician supervision requirement. Oftentimes, um, physicians actually work in the nursing home, uh, but CMS did not give them a break at all. And in fact, even though a nursing home is not is considered a patient's home, um, CMS has distinguished that. And nevertheless, in order for incident to services to be met, the requirements to be met, 
requires that the physician actually uh, be in the patient in in the office of the nursing home, the four walls of the nursing home, in order for incident two services to be met. In other words, when physicians have offices in a nursing home, um, the direct supervision is met only if the physician is in the four walls of his or her office and then sees the patient in that office, rather than traveling, you know, throughout the nursing home, seeing patients bedside in the patient's room. Okay. So there, uh, perhaps because of the potential proximity, uh, CMS did not exempt those services and nevertheless still requires uh, direct supervision in the four walls of the office of the physician. Diagnostic services, as mentioned uh, a couple times before, is another category of services that require physician supervision. And depending on the test, there are a variety of levels of physician supervision that CMS has imposed. Again, for many of these tests, you can find out what level is required by uh, reviewing the uh, physician fee schedule database. Um, CMS uh, try to be pragmatic here as well, and if indeed certain non-physician practitioners render the service, for example, a Medicare um, nurse practitioner or Medicare physician assistant, if it's those folks rather than a registered nurse or medical assistant or somebody else who is not able to enroll directly in Medicare, but rather uh, certain non-physician practitioners who are enrolled and who can enroll directly to Medicare, when these tests are performed by them, no physician supervision is required. Okay, so CMS did make that made that exemption to accommodate really current medical practice. Furthermore, especially in the LCDs, okay, the local cover determinations, you'll see that Medicare policies require certain qualifications of the supervising physician. This isn't true for many other services. They just want to see a physician, okay? But for certain types of diagnostic tests, uh, the local Medicare contractors have issued LCDs uh, further specifying what type of qualification that supervising physician must have. For example, a cardiologist for a cardiac test, um, a radiologist for certain types of imaging tests. So you'll, you'll, want, you'll want to note that and make sure that you review your local uh, contractor's local coverage policies uh, uh, to make sure that you're fully compliant when performing those diagnostic tests. And speaking of diagnostic tests, um, there's actually a separate enrollment category called IDTF, uh, and again, CMS promulgated regulations regarding this. This is purely a creature of Medicare to enable non-physicians, non-hospital uh, providers to furnish diagnostic services, okay? So literally, you and I can own an IDTF, and as long as we meet the requirements uh, to have our center enrolled as an IDTF, for example, have a supervising physician on staff and have all certified technicians on staff and so forth, um, we can actually render uh, furnished diagnostic services and bill Medicare and collect reimbursement, even though we're not part of a hospital, even though I'm not a physician, okay? But the diagnostic services are in essence the same, although limited than a general physician office. Um, so you have to know from your local coverage determinations what types of tests uh, an IDTF in that jurisdiction can actually furnish, okay? Similar to all diagnostic services, the physician supervision level varies with the particular test. An IDTF can be fixed or mobile. Now, you might think that that makes it easier, but no. If you have a mobile IDTF, for example, a mobile ultrasound provider, or a portable x-ray supplier, for example, although they're not an IDTF, they're actually separate. Either way, if you, if you have a portable device, medical equipment in your van, and you go to nursing homes, or you go to a physician offices, and that particular test requires more than general supervision, like direct or personal, that means you need to have inside that van, those, so to speak, four panels of the van, a supervising physician who can render the requisite level of direct or personal supervision, okay? So having a mobile 
but uh, IDTF is not necessarily easier uh, as opposed to having a fixed um, freestanding center. Now, unlike a physician office, however, because an IDTF is not owned by physicians or not required to be anyway and not owned by a, or affiliated with the hospital, the particular technicians that actually perform the test must meet all applicable state qualifications, certification, registration, and other requirements. Okay, that's a major difference. Those same individuals working in a physician office are not subject to that. Why? Because it's a physician office. But here, because this is a non-physician, non-hospital location, those individuals, those technicians performing those tests must meet all those applicable qualification requirements. And an IDTF here is an example where CMS has actually set in a regulation the maximum number uh, a physician can supervise, and it's three. So a one particular supervising physician may supervise up to three IDTFs. Okay? It doesn't say that once you're in an IDTF, you're limited to three tests, but especially when IDTFs are performing general supervision tests, then that means a supervising physician in his or her office may technically be listed as the general supervisor for three, up to three IDTFs. Portable extra supplier, it's actually different from an IDTF, even though it smells, tastes, looks the same. They're actually separately listed in the Medicare law and have separate uh, and additional uh, and different requirements. But all of their services uh, require general supervision. So that's why it looks the same in terms of physician supervision uh, compared to an IDTF, okay? Um, they are all inherently mobile, so you may compare a portable X-ray supplier to a mobile IDTF, but a mobile IDTF actually might be able to perform additional services that may be mobile, whereas a portable X-ray supplier is limited in the, in, the, in the type of services that it can render. Now, just as a side, you should note that portable X-ray suppliers are actually paid for the transportation, However, for whatever reason, um, neither Congress nor CMS has uh, permitted payment for transportation for mobile IDTFs, even though the vans that they drive look literally identical. But again, portable access suppliers, yes, physician supervision, and yes, it's only general. Radiation therapy, as I mentioned earlier, this is actually separately listed in the Medicare law with its own uh, requirements, um, even though chemotherapy is not. Um, but this is also one of the types of services where you can't find the supervision requirements in the statute, in the regulation, or even in the MCD or LCD. Surprisingly, you'll find the most clear articulation of the physician supervision level in the Medicare manuals instead. Okay? And when you go through that, you'll find that radiation therapy requires direct supervision, okay? Now, I want to make a note. A lot, lot of times, because of the equipment involved, radiation therapy is rendered in hospital settings as an outpatient service, okay? The direct supervision uh, is applicable uh, primarily to freestanding settings. Why? Because under hospital services, even though physician supervision is required, its definition and, and implementation of direct physician supervision is much more relaxed, okay? Why? Because CMS presumes and, and uh, uh, expects uh, physician uh, presence and availability in hospital settings as opposed to a freestanding ambulatory setting, okay? But either way, when you look through those source materials, you'll find that in the manuals, radiation therapy requires direct physician supervision. A variety of non-physician practitioners may directly enroll in Medicare, render services, uh, and, and receive reimbursement, albeit at certain lower levels, for example, 85% for a nurse practitioner. Um, but uh, they have some level of physician supervision requirements as well, okay? Of course, for whatever they do, uh, CMS defers to state licensure and scope of practice requirements. Why? Because even if CMS is silent on supervision levels, if the state, if state law requires certain level of physician supervision when uh, a non-physician practitioner performs certain types of tests, well, you have to you have to meet that. 
okay, even if uh, CMS is silent on that issue, all right? Um, typically, direct supervision is not required of any of these MPPs unless the physician wants to bill for their services as an in-situ service, okay? In other words, even though state law doesn't require it, if you, the physician, want to bill for your services of your physician assistant as an incident to service, okay, and, and collect at a 100% reimbursement level as opposed to the 85% that PAs receive from Medicare, then you have to meet all of the requirements of incident two, including direct supervision, even though, again, state law may not require that of uh, physician assistant services, okay? Uh, also, another example where CMS has imposed limits for CRNAs, uh, uh, a, a, a supervising physician can only medically direct uh, CRNA uh, up to four CRNAs, okay? So there are certain, certain circumstances where CRNAs may be working independently, uh, especially if state law does not require certain levels of physician supervision. However, in other situations, the physician might be involved or medically direct that CRNA for that surgery, and to the extent that, CR, that the physician is doing that, uh, in order to collect, you know, for example, 50% uh, of the reimbursement, whereas and the CRNA would collect the other 50% of reimbursement rather than 100%, um, CMS has imposed a limit of four uh, CRNAs to be supervised. Uh, physician assistants. Typically, every state law has some level of supervision, and it's typically general supervision, okay? So, yes, physician assistance uh, does require general uh, physician supervision. Um, in contrast, nurse practitioners, they don't really have a ph physician supervision requirement, but more, or rather, a collaboration requirement. Some states actually require that a physician and a nurse practitioner sign a collaboration agreement, and it may set forth um, how they collaborate, whether, um, you know, a weekly uh, telephone discussion, um, you know, uh, where the physician can be reached uh, in an emergency, whatever. So that type of agreement, if a state requires it, details those um, um, elements, um, but to the extent a state does require some level of collaboration, yes. CMS does refer to that, so um, even though the Medicare policies might be silent, when you're dealing with a nurse practitioner and his or her services, you need to make sure that state law is satisfied, including those involving collaboration. Same with clinical nurse specialists. Um, now, after that, these other types of practitioners, nurse midwives, psychologists, social workers, therapists, audiologists, uh, typically, there is no physician supervision required at all under state law. And in fact, CMS recognizes that and does not actually impose physician supervision levels either. Okay? So um, bottom line, physician super supervision does become an issue for some of the nurse practitioners, some of the non-physician practitioners, but in, in different ways, and for some, none at all. Okay? Medical residents. You may think that they're involved primarily in hospital settings, uh, and so physician supervision does not apply. However, in, even in hospital settings, um, when a teaching physician is involved, a teaching physician may bill uh, and collect uh, professional reimbursement uh, for their services, reimbursement for their professional services, as if the teaching physician rendered that service uh, wholly, uh, in, in, in total. Um, the, key, the, 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 the issue is that the teaching physician must identify uh, the critical or key portion of a particular service. So if there's a appendectomy, the, the surgeon teaching physician would identify what the critical or key portion and must actually be in the OR with the medical resident for that, for that or those critical or key portions in order for the physician to bill and receive 100% reimbursement for the professional services of that surgery, okay? Now, sometimes CMS um, 
you know, which is unusual in my point of view, but CMS has actually set forth and dictated, um, you know, the practice of medicine in, in essence, and requires physician presence throughout the entire procedure. Colonoscopy is a prime example. Even though many teaching, if not all teaching physicians, well, I can identify certain parts of the colonoscopy where he or she needs to be present for, um, and, his, and probably historical reasons, um, CMS is requiring that the teaching physician be present for the entire procedure uh, while a medical resident um, is performing that service. Um, so that's, that's uh, one um, exception. Um, on the other side, uh, recognizing the need for um, non-surgical medical residents to uh, gain particular experience with patient interaction, if the medical residents are working in primary care clinics or family health clinics, um, CMS does allow the physician to supervise up to four residents. Um, and this means not in the office with the patient and the resident, but outside the office, but up to four residents and still allow that physician to bill uh, certain levels of low uh, ENM or evaluation and man management visit codes as if the physician performed those visits him or herself. Okay, So it's, it's allowing residents to have this solo interaction with the patients. Uh, meanwhile, there is a supervising physician outside the office supervising up to four residents and being able to bill and, and receive reimbursement. Hospital outpatient department. Um, the policy regarding hospital outpatient department has morphed um, numerous times, quite frankly. Um, they focused on the main building, I'm sorry, they focused on the provider base setting because it's the outermost uh, physical location. So in the main building, they're not as concerned. They're presuming physician presence and, and, and availability. Uh, if it's in a building still on the campus, they're still not that concerned because, again, they're presuming physician presence and availability. Now, if they're off campus, uh, that's where they may see some concern. But if they're off campus to a point where they have to actually meet provided base settings, and that means that a freestanding location is being treated for reimbursement purposes as if it was part of the main hospital. Okay, so they're being paid at a hospital under the hospital reimbursement uh, methodology rather than like a, like a physician clinic under the physician fee schedule. Okay, so that outermost setting appears to be the primary concern for uh, CMS. But it's very different in terms of what CMS expects. Okay, it really is, in essence, general supervision, um, um, and and doesn't even require the physician to be actually in the office unless those particular services require that uh, direct level of supervision, where the physician must be in the office. Okay, there is also some language in the manuals about qualification of the physician. You don't see this very often in the manuals, um, other than in LCDs, as I mentioned earlier, involving diagnostic tests. But CMS, after several renditions of this policy, has now settled into, all right, um, the, the supervising physician for hospital outpatient services are as follows. They do require that the physician have some capability, um, but not specifically be able to perform those services, um, and nevertheless can still be the supervising physician. But in terms of availability, it really is a general supervision other than those particular services uh, that require uh, uh, physical presence in the office suite. Now, they do separate, however, between diagnostic and therapeutic services, okay? For diagnostic services, again, the supervising physician must be capable, clinically able, all right, but doesn't necessarily need to mean that there's some historical experience with those particular services. Um, similar language in terms of direct supervision requiring immediate availability, but as I stated, does not mean actual physical presence in the office or even in the uh, uh, provider-based location. Um, now, the only exception to this is if we're dealing with a non-hospital uh, entity. Okay, Many hospitals don't have all of the equipment necessary, so they will contract with other uh, providers, um, 
more than vendors, but they're actual providers. There, for those providers to render those diagnostic services, because it's a completely non-hospital setting, not a provider-based setting, there CMS is imposing uh, the same direct supervision um, requirements as if the test was performed in a physician office, okay? So the relationship of that location to the hospital is a, is a dispositive factor in imposing that. But outside of those factors, if you're talking about hospital settings, you'll see that immediate availability uh, does not require physical presence, which is much more relaxed compared to freestanding locations. Now for therapeutic services or hospital incident two, um, CMS went even further and is actually permitting non-physician practitioners to be the supervising uh, individual, okay? Um, again, that individual must be clinically able, um, and but physical presence is not required. Now, for therapeutic services, incidents to slash therapeutic services, unlike for diagnostic services, CMS has, however, listed certain services that only require general supervision, which is even more relaxed than direct supervision. Um, and those and that list is updated periodically, uh, but 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 so so for those tests, the person does not need to be even clinically able. The person does not need to be immediately available. The person does not need to be physically present. It's general supervision. The first slide that we discussed earlier today, uh, but any other services that are not listed uh, there, you're you're requiring CMS is requiring direct supervision, which means you're required to have a physician or a non-physician practitioner who is clinically able, immediately available, but not necessarily physically present uh, in the premises, okay? Hi, Paul. It's Valerie. I wanted to uh, kind of give you a heads up. We're just about out of time here, so um, we have one more polling question, and I'm not sure how many other slides you have, but just wanted to make you aware of the time. Thank you very much. The, the polling question is at the end, and I only have, I think, a couple of slides. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, just quick notes in terms of audit work. Um, the common mistakes you'll see and that you want to watch out for is lack of documentation. It, it's, a, it's a shame, but I think, I'm sure it's, it, it, this isn't new to you, but um, obviously um, writing notes in the patient chart is most ideal, but there are other ways to uh, document physician presence. Um, not having any uh, physician presence uh, or supervision is, is obviously the, the, the most um, egregious error and, and would probably invite government scrutiny attention, but also just understanding what level is required. You may need to do general rather than, I'm sorry, you may need to perform direct supervision rather than general. Again, checking for LCDs and to the extent that the ordering physician and the supervising physician might be different, the claims must identify the actual supervising physician, okay? Because especially if, if the ordering physician was not even there to render the supervision. So these are some of the common mistakes that you'll see and things that Medicare auditors and, the, and, and government investigators look for. So making sure you have internal PMPs and SOPs addressing physician supervision is the most ideal situation. Even if you make a mistake, having those will help uh, explain your issues away to the government. Uh, again, reviewing LCDs regularly, uh, keeping daily logs or using calendars to make sure you identify who the supervising practitioner is for that day uh, for services that are that require physician supervision, and then just double checking that the right practitioner is listed on the claims to ensure um, accuracy. So with that, I would like to ask the final polling question, please. Okay. How many of the services discussed today does your organization furnish? Okay, we have about 86% voting, so I'm going to go ahead and close, close that. And we have 21% showing 1 to 3, 25% 4 to 6, all 
4% and 50% doesn't apply. Great. So, th so thank you. I, it sounds like I've, I've identified and addressed, um, um, if not all, most of the services uh, that you do uh, are involved in. So hopefully this uh, topic about physician supervision has been helpful. Um, uh, again, not just from a medical necessity and compliance purposes, but also for audit purposes as well. Um, I also apologize again for the technical difficulty. It seems like every time there's a polling question, my screen goes blank. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, thank you for your patience, and um, uh, I hope uh, this has been helpful. Thank you so much, Paul. We appreciate it. Everyone have a good afternoon.